my goodness, everybody. Such an exciting day. I am so happy to welcome Mr. Tim Claremont. And I have to say a big thank you to Tamika Warren for introducing me to Mr. Tim Claremont. He is absolutely mind-blowing, guys. And when you meet him and you hear him speak today, you're going to understand why I'm so excited. Because if you don't have somebody managing your money and helping turn money that's earned income into wealth in the long term, then you're missing the whole point of the business game, right? The business game is not just about making money. And then next year, I start over at zero. And then I make some more money. And then I start over at zero. And then I make some more money, right? We're trying to build something with permanence so that eventually we can relax, we can enjoy our life, we can live on the beach, whatever you want to do, right? That's the whole idea. And I want to, I want to let you guys know, For <laughs> I had a conversation with Tim just the other day, blew my mind. He's absolutely legendary. And if you read his website, holy crap, this guy's done everything. He's worth like a gajillion dollars himself and his company could be sold for a strong multiple, I'm sure tomorrow. Um, but Tim, thank you so much for being here. And I got to say, um, I, I know that always carving a little bit of time out of your schedule to spend with a group like this one is, is a really uh, big investment of, of time and energy. And uh, for you to be here, I really appreciate it, my friend. Hey, I, I appreciate all the accolades in the introduction. And, uh, you know, I have to say that was a really exciting intro. Everything that you guys just did, the music and all that stuff, what you just shared, you, you seem you seem like a really fun group. So I'm, oh, I'm, we have a good time. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that, that's uh, that's very great. And Tamiko, thank you thank you for the introduction. I'm I'm happy to be here and and share insights with everybody. Uh, one of the things you'll learn about me very quickly is I I don't like to waste time. And uh, we'll with with that in mind, uh, I've got a couple of things. So the first thing I'm going to start with, I have to do this disclosure since this is recorded. Uh, we you know we're we're going to be able to distribute this later on. Uh, I have to according to my chief compliance officer, I have to have this disclosure that's played. Now it's it's a minute long. Um, and uh, the easiest way to do it is just to uh, is to actually just have it played uh, from the end of my podcast. So I've actually got it queued up. Uh, I'm going to turn it up. Uh, you can listen to it as fast as you want to or whatever you want to do. Uh, if you're watching this in a recorded capacity, you know, obviously it's very important. So you should probably listen to it. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, hopefully you guys can hear this. OK, give me a thumbs up if you can hear it when I hit play. Investment advisory services offered through Clear FP Advisors, LLC, a registered investment advisor. Securities offered through Clear FP Securities, LLC member Fender Sipping. Exposure to ideas and financial vehicles discussed should not be considered investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell any financial vehicle. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Investments can fluctuate and when redeemed may be worth more or less than when originally invested. Financial professionals are not licensed in all 50 states. To find out if Timothy Claremont is licensed in your state, please contact his office. Clear FP Advisors, Clear FP Securities, and Clear FP Live LLC are not affiliated with nor endorsed by the Social Security Administration or any other government agency and does not provide legal advice. Annuity guarantees rely solely on the financial strength and claims paying ability of the issuing insurance company. By contacting us, you may be provided with information about insurance and annuity products offered through Clear FP Live LLC, NPN number 1942837 and or Clear FP Securities, NPN number 1974960. And there you go. All right, cool. If you really, really want to hear that again, it's on our podcast, Clear Money Talk, which you can check out on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. We drop a new one every couple of weeks, but we've been doing it for the last year and a half. Um, <laughs> thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. So happy to share all of those good details and all that good stuff. Now we can we can jump into this. And and to to really emphasize how much I value your time. I, I want to take you through a brief story just to just to get this going. So uh, this this is a, this is a true story. I, I, my kids, I've got five kids. So four from my first marriage. My fiance's son is mine now, as far as I'm concerned. So we have five kids between us, and they're all older. So out of college, all that good stuff. I'm an empty nester. Uh, and when my oldest son Christopher was going to kindergarten, so he was five years old. So this is you got to take this back about 18 years ago. And I'm driving him to school. Right, I'm driving him to school, and I get there about 20 minutes early. So his school starts at 8 a.m. It's about 7, you know, 35, give or take. And, and I thought, you know what? What am I going to tell my son that's going to help him get the most out of his day? This is his first day in kindergarten. So I, so I want to show you the lesson that I taught him that day because it's it's stuck with me. So let me go ahead and uh, share uh, share my screen. I'm going to share uh, share this with you here. Bear with me. All those technical issues, right?
All right. Okay, so I am right here. You guys can all see that clock? Okay, 7.38 in the morning, right? All right, so I drive up, I park in the parking lot. Class is gonna start in 22 minutes. And I'm sitting there and he's in the back seat in his car seat, you know, he's five years old doing that thing right in the middle. And I thought, I got it. This is what I'm gonna do. This is what I'm gonna do. And I said, son, I want you to look at this clock with me really quick, okay? Watch this clock, ready? Watch it. There. I said, son, did you see that? That's one minute of your life. It's gone. You'll never get it back. <laughs> that minute is gone. A minute can be a very, very, very long period of time. How you use your minutes will ultimately determine your success in life. There's no difference between you and every other human being born on this planet other than how you chose to use your minutes. The two limited resources are your minutes and your dollars. And managing your time is so important. The lesson I taught my son in this moment, I said, son, your teacher is about to give you her minutes all day long today. And she's not giving it just for a paycheck. She's giving it because she cares about you. She wants to see you and the rest of the kids in this class learn something that makes their lives better. And because of that, all I ask is that you focus your time on what she has to teach you because she's not going to get those minutes back. And that has stuck with me over all of these years. And so I just, I want to share that with you because it's been, it's been a significant moment for me as I think about time and I think about the importance of, you know, how valuable our minutes are. So I teach other financial advisors all over the world. Uh, I, this presentation was from a group of uh, Canadians that I was teaching as far as financial advising on time management. We have some time management tracker systems and things like that that, that we work with. Uh, and I am happy to share whatever is going to add value for you today. But I wanted to start with managing your minutes, I think, is the biggest differentiator between you and everyone else on the planet. So if you are not experiencing the quality of life or the thing that you want to experience in life, you know, I would encourage you to look at your minutes and look at how you're spending your minutes. A minute can be a very, very, very long period of time, as we all just saw as we sat through that minute. And what you're doing with those minutes will, will ultimately impact everything. Uh, one of the other lessons, so I've, I've learned a lot of lessons. I'm going to try to give you multiple tidbits and takeaways today. I'm going to talk to you a couple of things I'm going to share with you today. I'm going to share with you an investment strategy that a lot of my higher income earning clients use, those who are making over $250,000, $300,000 a year to produce additional tax-free income later on in retirement. So I'll talk about that. It's often referred to as what's called a LERP, life insurance retirement plan. So I will touch on that concept. I'm also going to share with you compound interest. And I think, you know, I, I get it's It's just like we just talked about time. We talk about time. I mean, you're, you're probably thinking like, man, do I really want to wake up on Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time and listen to this guy talking about, you know, time? Um, like, Probably not. If that's what I told you I was going to talk about, you'd be like, there's something else I can go do. But I hope that couple few minutes actually resonates for you and it sticks with you. And you remember that and you say, yeah, you know, I'm going to use my time a little more effectively because of the insights that I got from Tim and just, just sharing that stuff. So similarly with compound interest, I want to, I want to teach you a little bit about how I use that with, with clients and how I've been using it for 25 years. So I started doing financial planning in 1997, right out of college. I went to Whitman college out in Walla Walla, Washington. I was 21 years old. I was going to be a tax attorney. If you've ever seen uh, the, the, the Firm, I don't know if you guys remember the movie The Firm. I read the book by John Grisham, The Firm, when I was like 12 or 13 years old. And, you know, all of that crazy stuff in there with all these tax things. Well, right around that same time, I had had my very first job. Uh, and my first job was I was a DMO, a dish machine operator. I was a dish machine operator at a Sherry's restaurant. So I was working and I was making, I think it was like $4.10 an hour minimum wage back in the day. 
And I knew how many hours I'd worked and I knew what my first paycheck was supposed to be. And I went to that paycheck and I opened it up and I looked at it and I was like, what the heck? And I went home and I talked to my dad and I said, dad, who are FICA and FUDA and Fat Inc and Stat Inc and why did they all just rip me off? <laughs> and my dad taught me, well, that's taxes, Tim. You know, it's okay. I get it. Taxes. And, uh, you know, I'm like, okay, but yeah, that sucks. I don't like that. And I'd read John Gershom's book, The Firm, and I saw Tom Cruise in the movie, The Firm. And I was like, I want to grow up and be a tax attorney. That's what I wanted to do when I was 13 years old. I was going to be a tax attorney. So I chose Whitman College. They had the highest average LSATs in the Pacific Northwest out of the colleges out here. And so that's why I picked Whitman and went off. And after my last year, I got recruited by a financial planning company out of Bellevue, Washington. They said, Tim, you know, come do this. Uh, and I thought, I'll do this for, yeah, absolutely spot on nerd alert, by the way. I self-identify with that. <laughs> so uh, I, in fact, oh, I, I just got glasses. That's a whole nother conversation. So that totally owned the nerd alert moment. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I can still see pretty well without it, but I, I know it's going downhill. <laughs> as far as uh, as far as the tax stuff is concerned, I thought, you know, I'll have more on my resume when I go off to law school, I'll become a tax attorney. And uh, and instead, you know, I'll, I'll learn financial planning for a year. And after a year at 21 years old, I was 22. And I was like, man, I was born to do this. I love this stuff. So I ended up not going to law school. Instead, I built my practice doing financial planning and all this good stuff and sharing all of these insights. But I've always taken this education-based approach working with my clients. So our four values, and th this is an insight for you as well. If you haven't identified your values enough in your business to really communicate it succinctly, I strongly recommend doing that. You have them. You just have to discover them so that you can communicate them. And I, as I made an intention, intentional choice to say, you know what, I'm going to figure out what the values are that I really represent in my business. You can take these three by five cards. Here's an exercise for you that you can use in order to, to figure out your values and what, what they already are so that you can communicate it to your clients. Take the three by five cards. You know, those ones you used to do speeches on when we were kids in high school and all that good stuff. Get a pack of those. Write one word value on each one. So everything you value, there's so many things you value, you know, love, charity, faith, honesty, you know, integrity, all these things. And then throw them all on a table, like a giant conference room table. And then you're not saying you don't value these things but slide things off the table if there's something on the table that's more important to you. Get down to the top four, five, six that you feel like represent how you feel about your business the most and how you feel about how you engage with your clients. After doing this exercise for me, I identified our four values are education, choice, transparency, and empathy. So education, we teach our clients. They get, they get to learn how this stuff works. Choice, we always respect their decision. It's their money. They earned it. They can do whatever they want with their money. It's their choice. I'm going to give suggestions. I'm going to make a, give advice. I'm going to teach them about things, but they got to do whatever they want with it. Transparency. The only way you lose a client ever in any industry in the world is a negative surprise. It's a gap in expectations. They expected one thing. They got something different. That gap is a negative surprise and they blame you for it. And then you lose a client. So the way we immunize ourselves against negative surprises is we make sure we cover everything up front. We said, we're going to be transparent about all the pros, all the cons of any of these investment strategies, all the costs, all the benefits, what we can control and what we can't control. You know, how many times have you been blamed for things that were not in your control? Well, the client thought they were in your control. And so it was a negative surprise. So you clarify that up front. Look, I can't control the stock market. I can't control interest rates. They're climbing like they're climbing right now. now I, I can't control tax law. Taxes are going to change. But I can, I can control which investments we choose. I can control how we allocate that portfolio. I can control with a plan in place what I believe is going to result in you achieving your goals. You know, Those are things I can control. And then at the end of the day, the fourth value, empathy. When they are having a hard time making a decision and they turn to me and say, Tim, I get it. I understand the options that you just lined up for me. I really do understand them, but I don't know which one to pick. We give them an empathetic recommendation. We say, look, if I'm you and I'm in your shoes as you with your feelings, your life, you have to live with this decision. You know, it's not what I would do if, if I were in your shoes as me, but I would do if I were in your shoes as you, this is the choice I would make. And that's not always the same. It's not what some computer software says. It's a human level. So you got you to kind of connect with that. So education, choice, transparency, empathy, those are our four values. And I just encourage you to identify your own values so that you can tell a similar story. You already do this naturally. You just have to get clear on it. And, and our mission is we empower our clients and associates in their journey to achieve their unique vision of happiness, which is why I'm here. 
So I'm actually spending my minutes doing this. I, I'm 46 years old. I've been doing this for 25 years. I, I, could I could have retired several years ago. I don't want to retire because I feel like I can make a difference in the world. And I'm not ready to go sit on cruise ships. <laughs> Just not yet. Not all the time. <laughs> Sometimes, but not all the time. So fundamentally, I'm like, you know, I'm going to give you guys an hour of my life. You're giving me an hour of your life. If you add up the total number of hours that people are listening to, you know, the no total number of minutes, I mean, if 50 people listen to this for an hour, you know, we just lost over a week of production. That's 50 hours of time. I'm not going to steal that from the universe without, you know, giving something back. So I want to make sure I'm adding value for you. So I'm hoping you're learning from whether it's, you know, identifying the values within your business and your practice and what you want to do, or whether it's understanding the significance of time and, and being a little more intentional about your time management. Um, but let's let's go to that compound interest concept I was going to share with you earlier. So I, I was asked to give a speech to uh, the seniors at Southridge High School. So they filled the auditorium. And I went up there and I did my one minute thing that I just did with you guys. So it's really fun watching seniors squirm, right? As they're like having a really hard time sitting still for a minute. Um, and, and they didn't say, you know, you hear whispers. People are like, like what? is it broken? Is it, what's going on? You know, anyway, it's so it was, it was really fun. But the thing that I wanted to teach them is, you know, I had personal finance when I went to, I went to Beaverton High School locally here in Beaverton and uh, Brown Junior High School and, uh, you know, Butternut Creek Elementary School. So I you know, grew up out here in the, uh, you know, in the Portland area. And I live downtown in Portland now. My office, by the way, is right near I-5 and 217. I bought the commercial building. It used to be the Neil Kelly building in 2018. So you'll see the clear building if you're ever dry and I driving I-5 North towards Portland, Oregon, right? But when you hit 217, it's up on the right side. You'll see a big picture of uh, my unfortunately recently passed uh, French Bulldog Pokey. Uh, he was driving my R8 and it says, uh, who's driving your retirement? So that's my building. <laughs> so yeah, um, we have a new uh, a new French Bulldog. Uh, it, her, her name is Angel. So it was, uh, we waited a, a while, but you know, it is what it is. Pets are family members, right? It's uh, yeah, everybody, you know, when you connect with, with family like that, it just, it is what it is, especially after the kids are out of the house and they don't care about you anymore. You know, the, the pets are always there to give you love. So as far as the seniors, back to that, back to that teaching, as far as the seniors and back to back to the high school class, I had personal finance. I don't know if you guys had personal finance as a class in high school, but they don't really have it in, in anymore. And when I went to college, I studied for three years at Whitman College before I graduated. I majored in economics and I minored in English and philosophy and I learned all this stuff, but it was in the first 10 minutes of my job when they taught me how to use a financial calculator that I was like, holy cow, that's mind blowing. And you, you guys might already know all of this stuff, and I get that, but I would encourage you, teach others who don't know this. So if you have a client who doesn't know this, if you have a kid who doesn't know this, if you have a friend of a client who has a kid who doesn't know this, you know, be the person in your, in your community who shares this. You know, it's basic algebra. When you think about basic algebra back in math class, you know, when you have two plus two equals four, right? If we, two plus two equals X, X would equal four. Two plus X equals four, then you know, X would equal two in that example, right? But when you take X plus Y equals four, all of a sudden X and Y could be three and one, two and two, 0.5 and 3.5. There's actually an infinite number of answers to that question as soon as you throw two variables into the equation. All this is in a financial planning calculator is a more complicated equation that has five variables. And you can plug in four and solve for the fifth one. So with the financial calculator, you could say, look, what's time? So let's talk about a mortgage. You guys are in, in the real estate business. You ever want to know what your payments are going to be like for your client as far as a mortgage and not have to call a mortgage broker to run that number? You, know, you can do that on your own financial calculator pretty quick. You say, look, okay, I want to borrow. Uh, they, they're going to borrow $400,000 to put down on their house. So $400,000 is you know, negative because the money's going away from them. Present value. So 400000 PV. You, you know it's going to get paid off at the end of a 30-year mortgage, right? So zero future value, zero FV. And right now, interest rates aren't the greatest. So let's say that interest rates are, um, I don't know, is five sound close-ish? Ish. <laughs> so yeah, um, it's, all, it's moving a little bit right now, but we'll use five. That's your interest rate. So you've just calculated three of the variables. We, you know, the last one it, before we solve is time, the 360 months, right? So 360 months. So what's their payment? That's what they want to know, right? They want to know how, do I have to, how much do I have to make as a payment? Well, it's $2,147.29. And you can have that answer. And this is like a $50 calculator, a $40 calculator at Office Depot or Office Max, wherever you can run that number any which way you want. And you get that. Now that doesn't include taxes and insurance. So make sure that you factor in a little bit of a budget for taxes and insurance. But you, know, you can get this kind of number. The exact same five buttons in this equation 
this is why I nerded out when I was, you know, 21 and I got into this and I learned about this calculator thing. It's like, well, how much do I have to save every month to get to a million bucks, right? Like I want to become a millionaire. I didn't every 21 year old want to become a millionaire at some point? <laughs> like that's, that's something that, you know, this sort of at some point I wanted to become a millionaire. So I so, said, okay, well, if I take a million dollars and that's my future value and I start from scratch because I was broke at 21, I had negative, right? <laughs> I had debt, I had college debt. <laughs> and then if I invest and I get a reasonable rate of return, let's say I get an 8% rate of return, you know, well, I can either solve for time. I can say, when do I want to be a millionaire? And say, okay, that's what I have to save per month. Or I can solve for, okay, I'm, I can afford to save this much per month. How long will it take me to hit a million? So let's say at 21, I was like, you know, I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. That's nine years, nine times 12. That's 108 months. Well, I'd have to save 6,352 bucks a month. Or if I multiplied that by 12, that was $76,000 a year. So, okay, gives you a target. 76,000 a year, nine years. All right. So I'm putting in about $630,000, $650,000. And then the other 350,000 is the power of compound interest. Now, the more time you have, Einstein said the eighth wonder of the world is compound interest. The more time you have, the less money it takes. If I said, look, I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30, all of a sudden that payment is $670 a month like one-tenth as much because of the power of compound interest. So the next time you think about postponing an investment decision, remember the significance of time. Because the person who says to me at 21 years old, I want to retire when I'm 30. Okay, that's an aggressive goal. <laughs> you know, 10 years, we don't have a lot of time to do that. That's the exact same situation as a 50-year-old who hasn't started coming to me and saying, I want to retire when I'm 60. I got the same decade starting from scratch. So just because you're not ready till you're 50 doesn't mean that I can magically make compound interest work for you in a different way than a 20-year-old. 20-year-old retiring at 30 is the same as a 50-year-old retiring at 60 if they both start from scratch. So we need to have time. We need to have time on our side in compound interest. I'm a big fan of diversification. Love real estate, love stocks and investment portfolios, love insurance contracts. I, lo I love cash. You know, all of those things are an important part of your overall portfolio. A lot of times I see financial advisors and real estate professionals uh, diversified in very you know, overweighted in certain categories. You know, clearly it's natural as a real estate professional to probably have a pretty significant amount of your portfolio and your net worth in real estate. That's okay. You understand real estate. It is what it is. But diversifying to include other things creates additional stability in your overall growth and your overall portfolio. And, and I am a, a big fan, uh, like I said, of real estate. In fact, one of the other you know, quick little tidbits, if you're curious about, uh, we always do 1031 exchanges. If you've got clients who have, uh, let's say that they're, they've bought property a long time ago and it's highly appreciated and they don't want to sell it because they don't want to pay the taxes. And they're in their 70s or 80s and they're like, I really don't want to sell this because I don't want to pay the taxes. You know, you can try to talk them into doing a 1031 exchange and then swapping that property for another property, but they're still dealing with the headache of now they're switching to that property for another property. And then they got to deal with the headache associated with the new property. And so they're just like, they just put you off and they say, oh, I don't want to, I don't even want to deal with that. You know, talk to my kids when I die, they can deal with it. You can go ahead and get the listing then. Well, we have ways for them to sell that, do a 1031 exchange into assets, which are referred to as called DSTs, Delaware Statutory Trusts, where they become partial owners of large apartment complexes or other you know, commercial real estate investment opportunities where they can have that 1031 exchange, not have to pay the taxes, and then get their step up later on. Uh, alternatively, we also have some ways of doing special 721 exchanges where they can go into the real estate and then transition into a real estate, in, uh, a, a REIT, a real estate um, Gosh, why am I blinking right now? Yeah, real estate investment trust. There we go, REIT, real estate investment trust. So they can go into a real estate investment trust, diversified real estate portfolio, and they can have that money diversified and then they can have liquidity. And then when they get a step up with their kids and everything else, they can liquidate the portfolio. You all of a sudden get listings that you could have never have talked them into because they can get rid of the headache of managing property, not have to worry about the taxes. And that gives you, uh, you, know, it gives you some opportunity. So I, I share that with you because anytime I'm talking to other realtors, you know, if you can find... Any reason that somebody has said no to you listing the property or no to you, you know, helping them find a new property, if it's a good reason, like I don't want to pay taxes on the sale of it, and I'm still going to have to manage that other one, you might not have a really good argument to counter that. Hopefully you take that arrow and put it in your quiver and say, no, now I have a good argument to counter that. And you can always reach out and talk to me about those and, and learn a little bit more about them if that's of interest to you. I, I help a lot of realtors with that kind of stuff too. 
So let's let's hit with the remaining time we have. I'm going to try to give a little time for questions and answers as well. So let's hit with the remaining time we have some of the basic different kinds of ways of investing. Uh, and as far as, the, uh, thank you guys, I'm seeing a little bit of these little notes on the bottom. So I'm trying to pick up what I can and integrate it in as well. So I'm glad glad you find value in that. Um, the When you think about investing, well, this is one of the first things I was taught to, 21 years old, right out of college, started doing financial planning, all that. There are four basic categories of accounts. You have what are called open accounts, also referred to as non-qualified accounts. It means it's an investment that you got to pay the taxes on every year. The pros about open accounts or non-qualified accounts is they're completely liquid. You can access the money anytime you want. The cons, they're completely taxable. So if you make an 8 or 9 or 10% rate of return and you got to report it that year with your 1099, you're going to pay income taxes on it. Uh, for those of us who live in Oregon, it's the second highest income tax in the country at 9%, 9 to 10. California is the worst at 10. <laughs> so, uh, And by the way, we're the worst state to die in in Oregon. Death taxes are uh, hit everything over a million dollars, so you get uh, estate taxes here as well. Uh, but uh, but it is what it is. It's still a pretty great place to live. I'm I'm pretty committed to it. You just have to plan for the tax situation. And I'm sorry if I'm tax nerding out on you guys. Remember Tom Cruise from the firm wanted to do that, so I talk about taxes too often. I can't give you, as the disclosure said, I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm not giving you tax advice. Um, but uh, but I you know I do financial services and financial advising. So the first type of the four accounts, open or non-qualified accounts, that includes things like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, checking accounts, savings accounts, CDs, uh, anything that is not in a qualified tax shelter. So you got to pay those taxes each year. The second type of account is what's called a qualified plan. <laughs> not a doctor, but I play one on TV. I love that. Um, the second type is a qualified plan. So qualified plans include things like 401ks, SEPs, SIMPLES, KEOs, IRAs, Roth IRAs, all of those acronyms that you've heard previously that reference these. All they are is they qualify for special tax perks. That's what a qualified plan is. They all have different limits. There's only so much you can put in. Some of them, you know, you put the money in and it goes in pre-tax. So you don't pay the taxes on it this year. And then you don't pay taxes on the earnings as they grow. And then later on, you pay taxes on it when it comes out. Others, you put the money in now after taxes, it grows tax deferred. And then everything comes out tax-free later on. That's an example of a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k. Anything with Roth is going to be tax-free later if you follow the rules, but you don't get the tax break on the front end when you stuff the money in up front. The third type of account is what's referred to as a non-qualified annuity. So these are different from non-qualified open accounts because they create tax-deferred growth. So your money goes in after taxes, you get tax-deferred growth in the earnings, and then later on you take the money out. The earnings come out first, so you'll pay income taxes on those. But then that after-tax bucket of money that you, you put in originally, that comes out tax-free. It's the last money to come out. Uh, they call that a... Uh, LIFO basis. It's taxed on an LIFO basis, last in, first out. So the last money that goes in is the earnings. That's the first minute it comes out. You got to pay taxes on it. And then the fourth and final category is life insurance. And life insurance uh, can actually be used as an investment. When you're working with life insurance, I told you I'd touch on life insurance retirement plans a little bit, give you some insights into that. When you're working with life insurance, there are two different ways of using life insurance. One way most people are pretty familiar with. How do I pay the least amount of money possible to get the most death benefit possible, right? That's, that's the way most people think about life insurance. It's like, I want to pay the least amount and I want to get a big death benefit. So when I die, my family takes, you know, that's what term insurance is. You're renting your insurance for 10 or 20 or 30 years. At the end of that period of time, you don't have any equity in it. You're just paying every month saying, if I die this next month, then my family gets this. It's so cheap. There's no excuse to not have it. It's just ridiculously inexpensive. So if you haven't taken care of that need, one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is they just don't have adequate disability insurance for their income or life insurance for their death or you know they haven't protected their family. And it's not expensive, guys. This is, we break even at best if we work with term insurance on how much time it takes to set it up and everything. It's just cheap. Permanent insurance is different. Permanent insurance is gonna pay out when you die. So it doesn't expire. You're building equity inside of it, just like you build equity in a home. And when you die, whether it's in a couple of years or whether it's at 120 years old, you still get that tax-free death benefit at the end. And if you start younger, it's cheaper. <laughs> if you start older, it's more expensive. So the comment as it relates to depends on your age, totally, totally get that. I will say I've seen uses for life insurance, however, for clients, even in their 70s and 80s. Because if you think about those death taxes we talked about in Oregon, for example, would you rather pay dollar for dollar 
that death tax bill, if you've got $5 million and you pass it on in Oregon and you're single and you pass it on to your family, everything over a million is going to get hit with estate taxes in Oregon. That's going to run about 10 to 15%. So that $4 million above the first million, that's going to get hit with somewhere around $400 to $600,000 of estate taxes. And that check is due to the Oregon Department of Revenue right after they pass away. Very expensive. So what would you rather do? Pay four hundred to 600000 Or what if you pre-purchase that four hundred to $600,000 tax-free by acquiring a life insurance for something that's less than four hundred to $600,000? In your 70s or 80s, you might be able to buy four or $600,000 upon death for a couple hundred thousand dollars. And then you're paying pennies on the dollar to get that money available for your family to cover the tax bill, if you know you're going to face the tax bill later anyway. So those are the kinds of things you can also do with life insurance, where even as an older individual, it might make sense. Those require permanent insurance. All of that is still on one side of the fence. All of that is still on the side of the fence that says, how do I pay the least amount of money for the most death benefit? There's a whole other side of the fence for life insurance. Life insurance is fundamentally a chassis of a tax shelter. It, anything that happens inside the life insurance policy, you don't pay taxes on while it's growing inside the policy. You, in fact, there are ways to invest in this kind of like a jumbo Roth IRA where you can put money in and you can access the money out tax-free later on. So when you're using a LERP, a life insurance retirement plan strategy, what you're saying is you're saying, I want to pay the least amount for life insurance, uh, but I want to shovel in as much as I can. It's kind of like getting your own personal 401k plan where you're investing in the life insurance. You want it as small of a death benefit as possible to allow you to shovel money into it. Well, in 1986, the first variable universal life policy came out. And they didn't have limits on how much you could invest. So there were all these congressmen buying these little $25,000 death benefits and flooding them with millions of dollars, right? To get this tax shelter that's awesome and very inexpensive and have it grow. Well, in 1987, uh, Congress came out and, and put a stop to that. And they created what are called the TAMRA TEFRA guidelines, T-A-M-R-A, T-E-F-R-A. And those guidelines say you can't do that. There's a limit to how much money you can stick into these things. It's usually about three and a half, four times uh, your minimum in order to support that life, life insurance policy. So we back into what's the lowest death benefit possible to put in $25,000 a year, $50,000 a year, $100,000 a year, whatever it is you want to shovel into this kind of strategy. And then later on, you borrow against that asset. Now, do we ever have to pay taxes on loans? We don't pay taxes on loans, right? So you borrow against that asset. So that's tax-free and you don't pay it back because the loan balance just keeps building up against the death benefit. When you die, the death benefit is also tax-free. So the death benefit pays the loan off for you and the leftovers go to your family. So you can effectively build up wealth inside of this tax sheltered account and access this money tax-free and create another layer of tax-free income. So there are people out there, there's a couple of books out there that you can, you can uh, The Power of Zero by David McKnight and Look Before You Lerp, also by David McKnight, a couple of really great short reads to learn about LERPs as concepts. Now, some people get really extreme with this and they'll be like, oh, we hate taxes. I, you know, it's like, just, just do that. Don't do 401ks, don't do anything else. Just build all this tax-free money up. And it's like, okay, I get that. I can help you if that's really what you want to do. But the tax brackets, marginal tax rates, they get worse as you make more money. The first hundred grand a year, you're really not taxed that bad. Everything over hundred, it starts to get worse. So I try to create layers for my clients to be efficient with our taxes. Yeah, first layer is your social security. Maybe you're lucky enough to have a pension, then that becomes the second layer. Very, very rare. And I would say with this audience, highly unlikely that you have a pension unless your spouse is in a government position or something along those lines. So social security, that's your base layer. Then you're going to want another layer on top of that. And it's okay to be taxable, remember, if we're under that 100 grand a year because it's pretty low tax rate. By the way, there are state income tax-free states you can look at in retirement, like Nevada or Texas or Florida uh, or Washington right over the border. Uh, but you know, then you have to leave Oregon. So that's not necessarily fun either. <laughs> anyway, my point is uh, you, you want to build intentionality behind your income in your retirement years. And it's okay if you pay some taxes on that. Max out your 401k, work on all that stuff. And then finally, at the end of that, you can say, I want tax-free income now. How cool would it be if you're making 200 grand a year, but you're only paying taxes on 100 grand a year legally? You know, that's what we can do as we build up that retirement income stream. And I'll always allow and respect choice of the clients that I'm working with. So, you know, you might choose to say, hey, I, I want to focus my plan A on all this real estate, do all this real estate stuff. And that's what I want to do. And that's going to be my plan A. Okay, that's great. Same as any business owner. Any business owner that's like, hey, I want to focus on my business. I'm going to grow my business. I'm going to do this thing. It's like, totally get it. I Let me be your plan B guru. <laughs> you know, let me develop the, if that doesn't go the way you want it to, you at least have this. 
so that you're going to be okay with that diversification. And uh, if you need me to be your plan A guy, I can be your plan A guy too. Anyway, but it, 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 whether it's me or not, I, I mean that in, in general, you can work with any financial advisor. And, and if it's a good fit, you know, hopefully it is a good fit. You know, that becomes one of your most trusted, you know, counselors that you work with when it comes to money. You know, all the greatest leaders of the world in all history had that CFO that, you know, that's, that's basically the role that financial planners are soliciting you to get that job. So you have to decide who am I going to hire to be my personal CFO? And if you have one already, great. Like, I, I don't want to, I got a lot of great friends that are great personal CFOs, financial advisors for their clients. Um, and I don't want to work with everybody. I you know, only want to work with people that I have a good time working with. But, uh, but if you don't have a personal CFO and you think that we might be of interest, I'm always happy. We are taking on clients and you know, I'm still 46. I still got a good 15 years in me and doing this stuff. So um, looking forward to seeing how, more, how many more people I can help. We're nearing that that 40 minute point. I've always got more things that I can share and I can talk on, um, but I you know I want to give the opportunity for questions and answers as well. Uh, with with that in mind, uh, you know Jeff, where would you like me to go at this point? Do you want me to answer any questions? If there are any questions, if there aren't, I'll continue to share more insights and tidbits. Tidbits. Well, yeah, let's let's um take a quick pause and let's see if people have you know any questions that they wanted to bring up to the floor since you know we're at a good spot here. Um, does anybody have a question specifically that's come either out of the content right now or something that this made you think of that you're like, dude, this is such a great opportunity. Here's my own like personal CFO for an hour, um, you know, that where I can I can borrow a CFO, you know, rent a CFO. That's a there's a website you should start, Tim. There you go, um, rentacfo.com, <laughs> right? You know, it's but it's probably but, out there. <laughs> it, it probably is. It's probably already taken. Um <laughs> But, um, you know, it, and if anybody has a question that they wanted to bring up, otherwise, Tim, I, I mean, I will tell you this, I'm nerd not I've taken like five pages of notes here. It's awesome, man. So thank you for pouring into everybody. Really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy to do that too. Tamiko. So, yeah. Tim, thank you so much for being here. This is amazing. So I have a lot of term insurance. I have a lot of full life insurance and I have uh, real estate development property. So can I put money into one vehicle to borrow against it to develop that property? Yeah. So um, there, it's think, think of it like marinating, right? If you marinate a steak or something like that, you know, you, it can taste better. You know, so some people like the marinade. It, it creates, you know, creates quality. Some of these investments need a little bit more time to marinate before you can start using them. Uh, but you can use a permanent life insurance policy, whether it's whole life, universal life, variable life, all of those are just different versions of permanent life insurance policies and various policies will have different marinating times before you can start using them. So I saw one of the comments that was made earlier, that personal investment bank concept uh, popped up earlier. It is a great strategy and it is that, that infinite banking idea where you build the cash value inside the life insurance policy and then you can borrow against it to invest in your real estate or to do whatever other opportunities might occur. There are surrender charges on the policies. They're typically 10 to 15 years long. So you have to fund it enough that there's enough extra money above those penalties while they're phasing out so that you still have access to it. Every client wants three things when it comes to their investments. Everybody. They want liquidity, so they can access the money right away. They want safety. They don't want to lose a dime. And they want to make a killer rate of return. They just want to make a ton of money. So it's like, I don't have any investment that does all three. But usually you can lean hard into two of them if you're willing to sacrifice a little bit on the first one. So if you say, look, I'll, I'll sacrifice a little on liquidity for a little while, let that investment marinate, then you can have some pretty killer returns later in turn with some safety. Yeah, that's the, I like personally, I like the uh, IUL product as far as permanent life insurance. It's an indexed universal life policy. It's not in the stock market. Uh, so it performs differently for my 401k stuff. Uh, what it does, it has a floor of zero. So when the stock market goes down, you don't lose anything. So all my investments in the IUL have not gone down this last year when the stock market's gone down. But when the market goes up, you have a ceiling. So you're going to get somewhere between 8 and 10% typically. If the S&P goes up 20, you only get like 8. Goes up 15, you only get like 8. Goes up 5, you get 5. And then one of the other things that's pretty cool is there was an innovation on the IUL that happened about five or six years ago where they created, some of them have these multipliers where you could say, okay, I'm going to get a multiplier now. So now instead of like an 8% return, it's eight times 
2.1 or times 2.7. So if you're really aggressive inside your IUL, you could still have that floor of zero and you could still create these multipliers where you might be able to get as high as you know 25% returns in an up year when you're just hitting like an eight. My point is from a diversification standpoint, you have insurance contracts which perform very differently than the stock market, your traditional investments and your 401k stuff, which also perform differently than real estate and some of the other things. So having a little bit in all of it makes a lot of sense. I, I don't know if that was a long-winded answer to your question, but I, I felt like there was more to share. <laughs> I know we talked about IULs before previous. So question is, I have a whole life policy that's years. I had it for years and years and years, and there's a there's a great cash value. So can I take part of that cash value and start an IUL? Yeah. So just like the 1031 exchanges with real estate, they call it a 1035 exchange with life insurance. So you can do a transfer of your cash value from an older life insurance policy into a newer life insurance policy, and it's a tax-free transfer when you do that. It, we analyze the uh, we analyze the different choices between the two to make sure that makes sense. And you want you have to qualify physically usually when you get the new policy. So if things have changed in your health, um, then you might not want to do that. So we, first we qualify you for the new policy. We make sure that's what we want. We run the numbers. It looks good. And if, if everything looks good, we move forward and we can do the 1035 exchange. A lot of people do that. You know, the other thing that's neat is those older life insurance policies that you bought 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people weren't living as long back then. So your odds of death at 60 years old or 70 years old were much greater back then than they are today because people are living a lot longer. So the costs have actually decreased on a lot of the newer policies because of people living longer. And they, a lot of insurance companies didn't give those cost breaks to the older policies. So your older policy, you might think it's cheaper because I got it a long time ago and I was younger and everything else. And, and that may be true, but it also may be true that it's actually more expensive because people are living longer today and it's worth looking at. I've seen it go both ways. Cool. Good, great questions. It's, it's sort of this function of like where you guys want to take this. I'm so happy to share additional insights with all of you, but uh, there's just, um, there's, there's a lot of stuff I'm happy to mine. I have one more question that I wanted to pop in here on. Um, so I see a bunch of agents on here and I, I kind of know everybody's, you know, profile and that kind of stuff. And there's some folks who are, you know, like, let's say that they're making uh, 80 to 150 grand a year, right? Right now, mm -hmm. you know, what is it? What and, and, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times in real estate, it's like churn and then burn, right? You churn all year long and then you burn down your income. So what, what are your thoughts in terms of somebody who's in that profile right now, your recommendation, you're their personal CFO for the moment. What yeah. would you tell someone in that profile so that they can get to the next phase of their career or their wealth building journey so that they don't do what a lot of real estate agents do, which is where their retirement party is their funeral. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's not a good move. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, or uh, or wedding crashers where they're just gonna you know visit every, other people's retirement parties and funerals, or, uh, you know, cover things. So I get you. Um, so uh, the eighty to one hundred fifty thousand off. If you're in that range right now, then I would say the most important thing is to number one answer the what ifs. If if your family's dependent on you, make sure they're going to be okay. Because if you're thinking eighty to one hundred fifty, and I'm trying to get to the next level and they're needing that 80 to 150, you got to cover the what ifs. And then that's really inexpensive to just fix that. So then you can sleep well at night and know that like, if anything happens to me, they're going to be okay. Um, but set that aside. Let's talk about investing. So 80 to $150,000. If you want to try to get, get your own wealth to the next level and grow your income uh, you know, later on in retirement, or even grow your income or your liquidity in the short term, uh, grow your net worth, then you're going to want to look at some of the low hanging fruit. Roth IRAs, uh, are are an easy place to contribute money. If you've got active income, you know you can stick in the max. The max that keeps bumping up a little bit each year. It's like sixty five hundred bucks, give or take, depending on if you're fifty years old or older right now. So, and you can do that, and your spouse can do that too. So that's thirteen k a year you could stick into the Roth IRA. You're in a relatively low tax bracket at this time with the eighty to one hundred fifty, especially if you're a real estate professional, because you probably have some tax breaks that you can take as those tax deductions. So your taxable income might be even lower. That's okay to say, hey, let's put that money in now after taxes because my tax rates low. And then later on, I'll never pay taxes on it again, as long as you're willing to tie it up till you're 59 and a half years old. After 59 and a half, everything comes out tax-free. The nice thing about a Roth IRA, though, a lot of people will say, oh, I don't want to tie it up till 59 and a half, that liquidity stuff again, right? We give up liquidity, we get these other perks. Well, the Roth IRA is accessible. All of the contributions are accessible anytime. Only the earnings are tied up till 59 and a half. So if you stick in 6K a year for 10 years, you've got 60K that you could access anytime if you wanted to. It's just the earnings that are stuck till 59 and a half. 
And then after 59 and a half, it all comes out tax-free. So that's kind of the low hanging fruit. If you want some tax breaks, if you're feeling like, man, I'm still paying good taxes and I don't, you know, I don't want to have so much in, in taxes now, um, then having your own single 401k is another easy low hanging fruit option. So we set those up all the time for clients. You can shovel in as much as $27,000 if you're 50 years old or older, um, 21,500 or so if you're uh, under 50 years old plus a profit sharing contribution of 25% of your net earnings in your business up to a maximum of like 67, 70,000 bucks this year. So there's room to erase all of that from your tax calculation this year. So you don't have to pay any taxes on it. We just want to make sure that, well, what's better? Is it better to stick it in the Roth and pay the taxes at a low rate, not pay taxes later? Or is it better to take the tax break now? If your tax bracket's high, we want the tax bracket, we want the tax break now. So in a single 401k, Tamiko, I just saw your, your text there, I'll reiterate it. Uh, in a single 401k, you can stick in, these are those qualified plans we were talking about earlier. You can stick in up to 27,000 bucks if you're 50 years old or older, $21,500. These are last year's numbers. They've tweaked a little bit this year. so a little higher. The new Secure Act 2.0, it's even more room now. And on top of that, 25% of your net earnings in your business. So to a very, to a maximum of about $67,000, $70,000 uh, per year. And if you have employees, that's it, all you're doing is creating a 401k. If you have employees, you've got to dot some I's and cross some T's and deal with the employees because the employees have to be allowed to participate. But if you don't have employees, there's a lot of realtors that I know don't, um, it's great. It, it's it's really easy. You just open the account just like any other account. You just it's this giant retirement account that you can shovel a bunch of money into. And a lot of uh, you know higher income earning retire you know real estate professionals they can max that out each year and build up a significant amount of wealth in a relatively short period of time. Um, hey yeah. Tim, real real yeah. quick question. We saw this come through from Angie, and then I have a follow up question after this. Um, so she says, if you're over fifty. Can you do with uh, the Roth IRA kind of getting similar or same results? Um, so is is that age range um, still going to be able to see the same types of benefits? Yeah, I would. So I would say that even in your 60s, it can make sense to contribute to a Roth IRA because you you let it build up there. It's going to be tax free later on. It it's it all comes down to just looking at your taxes. So again, I'm I'm not your accountant. I'm not trying to become your accountant. I do not want to be your accountant. <laughs> I work together with your accountants, but. Um, you know, but you do want to pay attention to the taxes. You know, I think of, I, it's it's hard to not hear that John Grisham story and, and realize, well, maybe Tim just likes taxes a lot and, you know, and legally minimizing them wherever he can. Um, but the fact is, if you get a hypothetical rate of return on an investment of 10% and it's taxable and your tax bracket is 31 federal and nine state, well, there goes 40% of that. You got a six. That's not as good as an 8% rate of return that was tax-free. You might on the face of it, say, I'd rather get a 10% rate of return over an 8% rate of return all day long. Well, if the 10 is taxable and the eight's tax-free, the eight was better. So you got to watch the taxes. You got to watch the taxes. And I'm always paying attention to the taxes when I'm building a plan for clients. And that's, yeah, who here played video games? I played a lot of video games as a kid. I still play video games when I have downtime. I love video games. I think they're the great, they're so much fun. So you may hate video games and I apologize. We, you know, we can differ on some things, that's okay. <laughs> so at the end of the day, people hire me. Yeah, Atari, no, I, I love it. I did, I played Atari too, I remember Atari. Uh, ColecoVision and television, Nintendo, all that good stuff, Sega, um, you know, I, all that. Um, I'm, I'm playing Skyrim right now. I'm going back to it for fun on the, on the side. So it's, I do enjoy video games. But my point is, whether it's a video game or a board game or a card game or any kind of a game, the thing that's so much fun is there's a set of rules and you use the rules to try to achieve the optimal result. My job for the last 24 years is to play the game of making money for my clients and they hire me to do that. And the rules are constantly changing. I have to know tax law. I have to know insurance contract rules. I have to know securities. I have to know the stock market. I have to know interest rates. I have to know. And so I just get to play like the world's most fun, complicated game with various players in different situations and different stages of their life. And, and that's what they hire me to do. So it's just a blast. I love it. I can't imagine retiring because you know, I get to play video games and get paid for it essentially. It's, you know, with real money and, and help people make more money. And so, it, you know, I like, I like playing the game for them.
All right. So, so let's say somebody's in that 200 to 400 K range, right. Sure. Um, you, you know, and you're, you're having your kind of first conversation with them, but like, I know you've, you've done so many of these. I, I, I looked at your, if you guys go look at his website, it's unbelievable. He's, you know, he's worked with, with everybody and, and been on all the major news sources. So Tim's famous FYI. Um, but, um, so, but it's, but it's really like, so you're, you're talking to somebody that's in that, in that range, you know, and what what is it that you see as the common denominator in terms of their next step to build so that they can get to whatever it is, you know, like, because a lot of times I still see agents and they'll be, I, I'm making, you know, $400,000, $300,000 a year. Um, but how, okay, awesome. How much have you saved? Uh, nothing. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> that's what. Holy crap, man. Um, right. That's crazy. You know, and so what, what's the next move there? Yeah. So usually we want to make sure they build that baseline taxable income. So maxing out those 401ks. And by the way, I saw something in the chat earlier that said 97 total. I wanted to clarify that. Um, the It's 27,000 27, on the salary deferral, profit sharing up 25% to a maximum of 67 or 70. That 67 or 70 is inclusive of the 27. So you're going to cap out at about 67, 70 there. And so that, and that's actually on point with what you just said, Jeff, because you know, if you're making 250, 300, 400 thousand dollars a year, you're going to cap out on the, that low hanging fruit. You're going to hit your 60 or 70 into the 401k. You're going to hit your max on your Roth IRA if you're contributing to it. By the way, there's still ways to do that. Even if you're outside the income, we call it a backdoor Roth. You can Google it, whatever. But there's always ways to uh, take advantage of that low hanging fruit. But once you've saved that 60 or 70, or if you have employees, all of a sudden you're limited to closer to like the 27 or 30 uh, because of the employee situation and you got more money you want to save usually the next best place to go is the LERP I was talking about, that life insurance retirement plan. That is usually the next best place to go. And uh, it's not right for everybody. Not everybody's going to qualify. Not everybody has the same time frame. And if for some reason you're like, dude, Tim, I don't like life insurance. I don't want to do that. That's okay. I always have plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. You know, if you don't like plan A, we got plan B and C and D. And, you know, and I get paid the same no matter what my clients choose. That's the other thing. I designed my business model so that I generally earn about 1% of the assets under management per year. So, and when you get to a million, it goes down to 0.85, get to 2 million, goes to 0.75, 3 million goes to 0.5, and then 5 million, it can go to 0.4. So, uh, you know, I'm earning a percentage of your wealth. The more you make, the more, more I make. I'm a fan of you making more money. It's good for you. It's good for us. And because I don't care what you pick, I get paid the same. It allows me to be like, dude, let's just figure out what's right for you. And, and I can give you objective CFO, personal CFO advice that I think makes sense based on getting to know you. And, and we, we work from there. So Tim, I don't, I don't want to cut you off because I'm, oh, yeah. I'm loving every second of this, but let's talk about that really quickly because I know a lot of people, um, you know, they uh, got got nerdy on, on or maybe it was the first time they ever read a financial book. Um, when Tony Robbins, did you read his book, The, the Money Master of the Game, where he was like uh, interviewing all these folks and he went pretty hardcore on like, work with an RIA. And I know you are an RIA, which is awesome. But can you, for people who maybe don't understand um, the difference between a fiduciary and a broker, can yeah. you break that down a little bit and kind of help people to understand what that is and how that works? Yeah, that, no, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, so fiduciaries have a legal responsibility to do what's in your best interest first. They have to put your interests ahead of everything else, and they're legally liable for doing that. That's that's the way it works. Uh, a person who's a broker, they can put the company they're representing's interests ahead of yours. And, and it's a buyer beware kind of a situation from a legal scenario. Now, the reality is most financial advisors and insurance professionals are whether they're fiduciaries or not, they behave very similarly to fiduciaries. There are, you know, if you don't serve your clients and take good care of your clients, nobody's going to keep working with you. Pretty soon your business is out of business and that's that's just not smart. So you got to take care of your clients. But 25 years, I've been a fiduciary for my clients all along. So I actually have my own RIA uh, as uh, Jeff was referring. That's Clear P Advisors. You might have heard that in the disclaimer with the beginning of that one minute disclaimer. <laughs> um, the uh, I also have my own broker dealer, Clear P Securities. So I report directly with FINRA in that respect. And then I have a separate insurance agency called Clear P Life, which handles the insurance side of things. So there are a lot of different regulatory environment, you know, things in this environment. And I basically have businesses set up to work with all of those different ones. Uh, but my whole thought process was choice. It goes back to education, choice, transparency, empathy. I want to have all the options available for my clients to say, you know, if they're if it's a good option, why would I not want to have that available? So if I want to have that option available to my clients, I have to be able to play in all of these parks as it relates to being a personal CFO. And the minimum investment, by the way, that we have in place is 250000 bucks. Most of my clients have one to $5 million, but I feel like that's a low enough threshold. Most of the time people can get 
up to 250k pretty well on you know some assets and things like that i think that's awesome well yeah. man this is this is really good i do want to hit pause right here because i know i've i've been asking a lot of questions and and really guiding this um and actually you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna do one more let's let's do one more sample example because i think um i think i'm like looking through the cohort here so let's just say that you're in like 400k to 700k or 400 to 600 something like that like that's your next threshold. And I, I see a lot of agents on here who that's basically their income. Um, yep. These are folks who definitely are making more intelligent decisions with their money. They're, they're starting to save some, but it, but it's going to follow different types of protocols. If, if you're talking to them with your experience, what is it that you find is usually the best strategy for them to move forward and really amplify that? Uh, so it becomes a wealth position, not just an income position. Right. Usually very quickly, I can identify the holes in their situation. So, and everybody's going to have different holes. So when you have income in that $400,000 to $800,000 range, you've probably filled a lot of the holes um, on your own, but they may not be the same ones that somebody else filled if they have four hundred, eight hundred thousand. So everybody's case gets very specific and very unique at that point because I have to look at your your financial plan and say where are the holes, and then I teach you about it. Say, okay, here's a hole that you have in your plan. You can fill it. Here's how we can fill it, or you can choose to leave it there because again, it's your money, your decision. So <laughs> we can decide what makes sense and then and then fill that. You know, it's kind of like taking Swiss cheese and turning it into cheddar. So it's like, you, you've got a Swiss cheese situation and I want to make it cheddar for you, or at least say, hey, I love Swiss cheese and these are the holes I like. And that's okay too, because you know it's it's your money. So I wish there was an easy answer, but there really isn't because it just depends on each individual person's situation. Almost on, I didn't unmute myself. Um, <laughs> that's awesome, man. I really appreciate that. Well, it, I, and you know, I actually, I mean, I've, we've seen that in our own financial positions. We like looked at things. It was like, oh crap, we totally didn't eat. like sometimes it, what is it? They call it an unconscious incompetence, right? You don't know what you don't know. And yeah. I, the way that I always put this to people is like, you don't know what's in your blind spots because you don't even know that there's something there. Right. And so how, how would you gain intelligence about that? Unless you talk to somebody who makes this their life's passion and how many people on this call, right? Like have ever spoken with a client who's like, Oh, I didn't know that I could do that. Whether it was, a, you know, I, I've talked with people who were, who were uh, military veterans who didn't know that there was a VA loan, like, that's crazy, but it was just a blind spot, right? It's not because they're dumb, they're smart people, but they just weren't informed. And so it was a blind spot. So a lot of times, you know, there's gonna be really killer stuff that's gonna be able to move you forward quickly. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to maybe make uh, a quick opportunity here since we're kind of, you know, we're gonna roll down the, the call in, in the next uh, 30 here with the group and we've got a couple more things to talk about, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about your firm. What's the best point of contact? How do people, if people wanted, if they were on this call and they're like, dude, that's rad. Like, and I, I do have, you know, I've been saving money, um, but I put it in my savings account so I can point, you know, get 0.000005% every year um, and retire when I'm 3,600. Um, you know, if, if they're doing that or whatever, um, it, you know, what, what's the next step to, to touch base with you guys? Yeah, I'm happy happy to do that. So I found that uh, if you're ready to, to just reach out and touch base, you know, we usually schedule a 15 minute get acquainted call. So all you do is call 503-579-1000. That's our office phone. And you say, hey, I just, you know, saw Tim on the, you know, the presentation that we just had this morning. Um, I want to schedule a get acquainted call. There's no fees, no obligation. They'll book you for 15 minutes sometime in the next couple of weeks. And I'll have a live conversation with you. We're going to answer whatever questions bugging you at that point. We'll talk through things. If we think there might be a good fit for us to work together beyond that, we'll say, okay, great. I'm going to send you out a confidential so you can share more information with me. And then we'll schedule a follow-up one-hour conversation where it'll either be a Zoom or face-to-face -face if you're local or you want to come in for the face-to-face, -face, that's great. Uh, again, no obligation or cost for that. And at the end of that hour and plus the 15 minutes that we've spent, we usually have a pretty good idea if it's a good fit or if I could do more for you. So, so that's, that's our process as it relates to working together. If you're feeling like, hey, I just want to learn some more stuff on my own, whether you're going to call me on that 15-minute thing or not, uh, the podcasts are on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It's just search Clear Money Talk. So if you go to any of the places where podcasts are, search Clear Money Talk. And all of my old shows are there for like the last year and a half too. So you can check those out. Uh, and then the I have written two books. So my first book is called Passionate Ambivalence, How to Sell with Authenticity and Integrity. They're both out there uh, on Audible. So I like to listen to Audible. So I created Audibles for them. Uh, the second book is called uh, What Should I Do with My 401k? Should I Buy an Annuity? 
and that's available on Audible as well, uh, on as well as on Amazon. Uh, I will say the first book's out of print. We're looking for uh, building in a new printing relationship, so you might have to deal with Audible or pick up a used copy of it if you if you have that. The second book's still in print and uh, and available. Uh, and then I also uh, created an app that's free that you can actually check out if you search on your phone, Clear FP Clock. Uh, so two words, Clear FP, C L E A R F is in Frank, P is in Peter. So all one word, Clear Financial Partners is my company, so Clear FP, and then Clock like time. Uh, there's an app where I basically teach the first, second, third, and fourth money that everybody should touch. And you can go through and create your own clock presentation of your, your personal financial circumstances and, and just learn some of these other things. You know, I, I wanted to get it out to the universe so that you guys can all use it, especially if you're not at that 250 level yet. So you can kind of get there. And then when you get there, you can, you know, connect with me and I can, I can help you out there too. So, um, so yeah, a couple of books, podcasts, and, um, and the app, those are places and our website's clearfp.com. So you can always go to the website, and check stuff out there too. I got it. Um, well, that is, man, that's awesome. Thank you very much for sharing that with everyone. Really appreciate it. And I put all, all that in the chat. Um, does anybody have any follow-up questions while Tim's uh, rolling out? I know we talked previously and Tim had about an hour to be able to, to, to give to this. He's a busy guy, um, which is awesome and really, really appreciate it. But you know, one of, one of my core concepts has always been that numbers are the language of wealth. And a lot of times we'll, you know, you do a presentation with real estate agents, you talk about social media and you'll have 6,000 people show up and they all geek out. Um, and the people, here's what I want to applaud all of you guys for showing up today and really investing in yourself because you have to love numbers. You have to love the accounting of your business because that is the language of wealth. If you want to become wealthy and not just have a good income and then die eating cat food, um, guess what? You need a, that personal CFO. And Tim, I, I'm blown away, man. That was not only, by the way, not only was it a great presentation, but you're clearly an approachable guy who can talk to, I, the number of like accountant types that I've talked to where it's just, they're speaking Klingon and it's absolutely, you know, and you're like, dude, come on. Um, the entry level, by the way, again, just to reiterate that, um, you're gonna need a $250,000 uh, initial investment, right? So for those of you who don't have it, just sell both kidneys. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, <laughs> You know, there was a lot of great advice today, but we, that's that's what we do in all of our other sessions is talk about how to increase your income, how to increase your production so that you can get to that base level to get there. Um, and Tim also gave us some great uh, pointers in the 80 to 120,000. Tim, what, what other uh, points did you want to make, uh, you know, kind of before we we keep keep moving here on the call? Yeah, the only uh, last thing I would say is we do, so 250,000 for invested assets is our minimum, but if you don't have that yet, but you want to start a LERP, we don't, we waive that minimum. So if you say, Hey, I want to put in 25 grand a year, 50 grand a year into a LERP, and that's your strategy. We can, we don't need to be at that minimum level. We'll, we'll get you there over time. So Dude, if, if the LERP is appealing and you want to do that, you, you know, just reach out to me and we'll, uh, we'll have that get acquainted call. We'll, we'll go from there. It's all individual. Everybody's personal. So I appreciate your minutes. I want to say thank you for your minutes. I can't give them back to you. So I hope you got value out of it. And, uh, and, and thanks for the opportunity to share guys. That was so cool. Thank you very much, Tim. And, and I hope you guys all give him a little bit of love in the chat uh, for spending some time Thank with you, us Tim. here today. Woo! Thanks, Tim. Man, that was so incredible. good. Amazing. Really hey, appreciate that, Tim. Hey, My guys, uh, Tim, we'll, we'll let you go. Um, but but just so you guys know, um, so I, I really have that core belief that um, that numbers are the language of wealth. And so I want to reiterate this because you know, um, it was interesting because I remember when Tamiko brought this uh, to me today. And Tamiko, I'm going to pull you up on stage here in a second, so I want you to be ready for that. Um, but Tamiko, you know, had this idea. Hey, wh why don't we bring in? Um, she's like, my, you know, uh, got, got this amazing contact, and oh my gosh, you know. And I was like, a financial planner, you know. And then I thought about it, and I was like, yeah, I've always believed that there's a huge deficiency that faces real estate agents because you see agents trying every single day to just take one more listing. And then when you sell it, you're broke again, right? How many people have experienced that? I hope this is you. I hope you're relating to what, well, actually, I actually hope it isn't you, um, but I hope at least that you're listening and you're like, okay, I can kind of relate to that. And the truth of the matter is that when you look around and you see people who are wealthy, not just have a high income, but are wealthy. And by the way, there's a different, you, you walk different when you're wealthy. I'll let you know. You breathe differently. You sleep differently when you're wealthy. And it's a very big difference. And the difference doesn't have to do necessarily with how much money you make every year. It's about how you make your money work for you every year. 
And I remember hearing that the very first time, which was, I like to take my money and I send it to work every day. So at the end of the day, I have more money. And if you're not taking some portion of your income and doing that, that's a missed opportunity. And you're like, Jeff, I'm having trouble making ends meet. Great, let's talk about that. That is what every single other Core 90 presentation is about. It's about how to do increased production, how to increase your jam out rate in the real estate market. And we kill at that. But if all you're doing is doing that and then every single year you spend every penny that you made and you're not moving your life forward, I will tell you there's gonna be a day when you look backward and you go, shit. <laughs> I totally boned that up, right? But now it's too late to, to fix it, right? So you don't wanna get there. And that's gonna be like, you know, 90. Right? I, I promise you, even if you're, you're watching this and you're like, well, I'm 62, what do I do? That's okay. I, the, he was talking about the power of compounding interest, but there are other things that you can do. And if you speak to someone sophisticated, Tim's amazing. But by the way, there are other great people. I, I don't want you guys to ever feel like this calls a sales pitch. There's nothing in it. We're not getting some weird kickback. In fact, that, that would be illegal in the, in the investment world. Um, we're not getting a kickback. It's just Tim's a smart guy and he's got a great reputation, leads with heart. Um, Tamiko, what are your thoughts on this whole concept though of building wealth versus building income? Well, you know, I, I, I look at things as if I think I need it, then there's somebody else in our group that absolutely needs to hear it. And I wasn't really smart with my money in full transparency. I, I know how to make a lot of money and I know how to spend a lot of money. So the one thing that I did early on is I invested in term insurance and I was actually thinking about canceling that going, gosh, that's, you know, we're in a different market and I need to really reduce reduce some expenses? Do I, do I reduce my term insurance policy? And I've got four more years on it. And so, okay, well, I'm not doing that. Maybe it's bring a horse home and not board a horse. But I figure if, if I need help in the financial realm of my life, then I know that somebody else also needs that as well. So I invested in, in term insurance. I invested in whole life policies. I have two whole life policies. You know, I have some real estate and I don't know what to do with it. I don't know that I'm doing the right things. And so, again, it's always going out and finding somebody who is doing it at a greater level, better level than you are and learning from them. And I'm 56 years old. So it's, you know, it's a, it's, I'm starting off slow and, and catching up. So I hope that was valuable to you guys. I love him. He's amazing. It was hugely valuable. And, and that's where I want to reiterate. It's not too late. It's never too late to start. And what's interesting too, is when you start to approach financial planning, um, however you're approaching your wealth positioning, what I will tell you guys, oh, hold on one second, we're gonna mute that one. Bada boom, bada bing. All right, did we get it done? All right, had a squeaky wheel there. Um, but when when you approach financial planning, what, what starts happening is you start thinking about your money differently, which means you'll approach your business differently. A lot of times I talk to real estate agents, right? And how many of us out there have a budget for our business? You know exactly what you spend every month, exactly what you make every month, right? And this is not, you know, this is not confession right now. So you don't have to raise your hand if you, or not raise your hand if you feel bad. Um, but I will tell you, if you don't, these are all these principles align. And when you see great producers, great business owners, people who are truly excelling in the business world, the reason is, is that they've taken serious the stuff that other people avoid. Well, I just want to do the fun stuff. I just like showing houses. I just like saying, this is the kitchen. That's great. And that's awesome. But that's the easy part of the job. The hard part of the job is figuring out how am I building this into a career so that it's actually not a job. Because otherwise, all you're really doing is you're self-employed. Turns out you're not just a great, uh, you know, real estate agent. You're also a terrible employer. And when I had that realization, like I'm self-employed, that means I own the business. Holy crap! I have to do business really, really well, right? And unfortunately, or fortunately for you, depending on how you feel about numbers, but numbers are the language of wealth. They're also the language of business. And so when you start getting good at numbers, then you start getting good at business. It's amazing, right? And there's small incremental um, increases that you can make over time that'll make a huge difference. So it's really awesome. I wanted to just give one more second here while we've still got everyone on the call. Does anybody else have any questions while now while it doesn't feel scary because we don't have the guest speaker on um, that you wanted to ask 
um, since we since we have, you know, I'm uh, happy to spend the rest of the time that we have set aside for the call. Hey, Jeff, I just wanted to say really quick, you know, in our old days of Keller Williams, right, Gary Teller used to say, you can accomplish anything in five years with, with intent and clarity. And so for, for us who are thinking that we're behind, you know what, be clear, be intentional, we can catch up, we can accomplish anything in five years or less. Couldn't agree more. Um, in fact, I, what is it that uh, Tony Robbins always says that people tend to overestimate what they can do in a year, but underestimate what they can do in 10 um, right. A lot of times we're like, oh, that's not possible because you're thinking too short term. You don't understand the power of inc small incremental changes. And in fact, let me show you guys. This is an exercise that I saw a number of years ago. Really makes a ton of sense. Let's just say that, for instance, um, you're 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 doing lead gen in your own business. Here's leads. Here's appointments. Right. Uh, and here's clients. Whoops. A lot of times what agents will focus on is, well, gosh, I, I just need more leads and then they'll leave it at that. But the, here's what occurred to me really early on in, in my career is that there's a conversion rate between each of these stages, right? That matters. This conversion rate, let's just say, and then, you know, for some of you guys, that's, that's awesome. If uh, let's give you a healthy percentage here. M most of you are probably even better than that, right? Most of your appointments turn into clients because they just love you the second they meet with you. But what if we started to say, wow, if I was able to, and you can, there's different ways to do this. And we talk about this stuff on Core 90, but if I could increase leads by 20%, right? So if I could increase leads plus 20% over here, and I could actually, in fact, I'm going to do a, base, a more basic exercise. If I could increase leads by 10%, forget 20%, all right? I'm going to make it even easier for you guys. 10%. Um, well, what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know how you're getting leads. That would, we'd have to look at your business. But if you could increase leads by 10%, if you could increase your appointments by 10%, and you can increase your clients by 10%, and I could break down how the math actually works on this. What's interesting is that this 10, 10, 10 actually produces a massive return on the back end of your business. Sometimes we think we need monumental changes in our business in order to produce massive shifts. And I could break this down with numbers. Um, and I, I'll, in fact, I should do a whole training on this because it would be really exciting. But when you start to see the power of, this is compounding interest as well, as it turns out, but it's inside your business. And this is where you can compress over time. So we learned today that, you know, compounding interest is the eighth wonder of the world. We learned the power of compounding interest over time. What's interesting is you don't need 25 or 50 years to compound small effects across the transitional phases of your business to affect what you're getting in terms of outcomes in year one, like literally this year. You're like, well, it's a down market. Listen, it's a down market, but agents are leaving the industry right now. And as it turns out, I don't know if you guys know this, more agents are leaving the industry than listings are which means for the agents who just stay put and don't freak the hell out because you're watching the news, guess what? Your business can actually grow over the next 12 months. What? Yeah, they don't put that on the news because they don't know that crap. But guess what? If you simply invest yourself in the core fundamentals of building a solid real estate business, there's going to be more business per agent at the end of the year. Woohoo! How many people get excited when you actually understand how math works? It's amazing, right? For me, for me, this is where I start getting excited. I'm like, well, there might be a few fewer agents, but if an agent who, you know, sold three houses last year leaves and now the, the market goes down by 30%, that means those two houses that they would have sold if they had hung out, the remaining two, right? Because they lost 30% are now available for one of you. This is what's happening right now. And it's called a mass aggregation. It happened in 08, 09. You saw people who got super wealthy coming out of that shift in the market. This is not the same thing, but out of that shift in the market, because they simply focused on lead generation behaviors that accelerated their business. It didn't slow them down. They built, you saw more millionaires created coming out of the back end of that in real estate than any other time in history. Bada bing. But I'm scared. All right. Be scared. I don't care. Just do the right thing. You can be scared until December when you go, oh, crap, that was a good year. That's awesome. I don't think scared's the right position to start from, but personal opinion. 
All right, what else we got out there? Anyone else have any opinions about, about um, the power of actual wealth planning or thinking about numbers in your business or just understanding math as it pertains to everything that we do in real estate? Because I'm telling you guys, this has been a journey I've been on. It used to be that when I would get my tax return, I would just poop my pants and I'd be like, ah, you know, and then I didn't know where to go and I didn't know what to do. And I got some really powerful coaching and advice and people who, you know, put me in a chokehold and were like, you have to look at this. And then what started to happen is I realized the more I understood, what I was actually afraid of is I didn't understand it. And when you gain clarity and understanding, your stress goes away. Because did you notice that Tim's not afraid of taxes? Why is that? It's not because he's worth a gajillion dollars. He is worth a gajillion dollars. That's because he's not worth afraid of taxes, right? That's, it's such an interesting um, effect that we, start to, that we start to have there. Let me pause myself and say, what other questions do we have? And then we should wrap up. No questions. I just want to say thank you for bringing this in, Tamiko. And you're right. Uh, you know, when there's something that you might need or something that you're looking for, there is other people. My wife and I, we've actually been looking for the right person to talk to about these things. And now, as soon as this is wrapped up, I'm calling 503-579-1000. So thanks for bringing this in for us. Bada bing. I love Bada that. Boom. That, Jason, that's awesome. <laughs> so cool man and bailey well, the fact that you're on this call man oh uh, gosh i hope you soaked all that in it's really powerful um and by the way be having these conversations with agents on in your organization on your teams whomever that is right agents that you know it doesn't matter where they are i don't care if they're at another brokerage have that conversation with them we want everyone to be successful in this world this is not an us versus them game right that's terrible you should just want to love everybody um but i will tell you this Reach out and love and help people and provide them with knowledge. As you Listen, when you gain knowledge or clarity or perspective, focus in your business, in your career, the opportunity is for you to now pay that forward. That's what other people have done for me. It's what I'm doing right now. And I'm telling you guys, that makes a difference. It makes a difference in how you feel every day. It makes a difference in whether you're leading with fear or forward action. It makes a difference in, in whether or not you wake up in the morning with energy because your whole entire mission in life becomes about helping other people. Well, I love helping other people, but only my clients, not other agents. Yeah, that's not other people. That's a limited subset. And now you're, you're being selective. Love everyone, help everyone. Build your web as far as you can and help everyone in the entire world. And when you do that, your life gets bigger. Um, I absolutely love that. And, and by the way, somebody put in there, building your team. I saw that Ali, um, thank you, Ali Puente is another amazing leader here in the community. Um, Ali said, build, embrace your team key players, your CPA, your financial advisors. Their fees are worth the value if you do it right. I completely agree, by the way. Um, when you start to get the people in your world who can help you, it's absolutely epic what's possible. But it's probably not going to be just you going to the end zone, right? I, the way I envision it is this. I'm terrible at sports analogies, but I'm going to give you one. Uh, hopefully this won't fumble. All right. So here we go. It's going to be a football sports analogy. But I will tell you this. Imagine really quickly if you put Tom Brady on the field by himself. He's self-employed. How's he going to do now? He's just going to be a puddle of goo at the end of that game. That's all that's going to happen. It's just going to be an assassination attempt, right? Like that's all that's going to happen. And a lot of real estate agents approach their business just like that, right? You got to have someone to pass the ball to. Thanks, Steve. That's amazing. And Steve Heron, incredible out in Colorado and Alabama running two teams. Um, yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. You got to have someone to pass the ball to. So who am I passing the ball? Oh, I've got this financial thing. I don't know what to do. Pass the ball. Boom. Personal CFO, right? That's what we learned today. Tamiko, thank you again. Everybody, thank you so very much for being here. It's so fun to help everybody grow their life and grow their business. Those are the cores of what we do inside the community at eXp Realty. We love you guys and can't wait to talk to everybody next week we've got an incredible core 90 by the way brace yourselves we're talking all about google 
how to use Google to get more business. If you're like, well, I don't have the 250K. Guess what? There's people using Google right now to make way the hell more than 250K. So you better show your butt up next week, 9 a.m. Pacific time, the same dang link. And it's going to change absolutely everything about how you think about getting found on the internet. Because if you're not on Google, you're not on the internet. Hope that helps. Talk to you guys soon. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.